Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour podcast. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, a value investing newsletter published by Stansberry Research. All right, let's do it. Time for the weekly rant. Okay, now this week, I want to talk a little bit about Father's Day, which is coming up. Uh, not the day, really, just the man. Uh, my father, Martin Ferris III, was born in 1925 in Baltimore, and he's still going strong. He'll be 94 in October. And I saw my folks uh, this last weekend. I went up to the Split Rock Resort in the Poconos in Pennsylvania to celebrate my parents' 70th wedding anniversary. 70th, 70. They honeymooned up there at Split Rock in 1949. The old split rock, she ain't what she used to be, but that's off topic. We'll talk about that, you know, some other time maybe. Uh, but, you know, it was really great to see them. And uh, I just felt like relating a quick anecdote or two about dear old dad, because I know I was impressed by the anecdote that I'm about to relate. So my father's a lawyer. And uh, for the last couple of decades of his career, he served as a, a hearing officer, also referred to as an administrative judge for unemployment cases in the state of Maryland. And I was born and raised in Maryland. And my father was born and raised there, lived his whole life, still lives there. So many, many years ago, when I was much younger than today, I was waiting tables and my car was, and I was living with my folks, which I did, you know, three or four times off and on in my 20s. Uh, and I lived with my folks at that time. So my father was kind enough to shuttle me back and forth a few times to work whenever it was too inconvenient to borrow the car. And one night he's driving me home and we were talking, we got to talking about uh, the family lawyer, whose name I cannot recall, and just say his name is Bob. And my husband said, yeah, Bob's a good guy. He's, he's competent. He does a good job. He doesn't charge a fortune, and, and, but he's no Clarence Darrow. And, you know, I was just kind of picking up the conversation, and I said, well, you know, who, who is like Clarence Darrow nowadays? And without skipping a beat, or changing his tone of voice or anything, my father said, well, the last person around here like that was me. And I was blown away because this guy, my whole life, you know, for whatever it was, 25 or 30 years of life at that time, he never talked about himself as being any great shakes at anything. Although he did talk about himself as being a good lawyer occasionally, but it wasn't like he was a big braggart or anything at all. So it took me back a little bit. He continued and he said, yeah, um, you know, on occasion when he was a federal prosecutor earlier in his career, uh, he, in the, maybe in the 1950s, uh, it would have, would have had to have been in the 1950s or 1960s. And at that point he, he was really good and he threw bank robbers in jail and, you know, they were screaming at him, telling them they were going to kill him when they got out and all that kind of stuff. And he was so good in court that people would set their lunch hour uh, by when they knew, you know, he was going to be arguing in court. And he said on one or two occasions, um, and I haven't established whether it's one or two, I don't think he can remember after all this time, the judges had his arguments printed up and bound up like a little book and handed them out to their friends as gifts. And no, I know what you're thinking. We tr I, I've asked about getting a hold of one of these and they're just, they're gone. You know, they're, there's no, <laughs> you can't, you know, we're, we're not going to ever see them. And I thought, wow, that was really cool. And he told me a little bit about his career. At one point, he was making the princely sum of $7,000 a year. And he said he really liked the job. Um, he was, I think that's when he was a prosecutor. And he said, I was good at it. But then somebody offered him $14,000 a year to go work. I think that was to go work for Senator Glenn Bell, senior, not junior, senior served in, as a senator in Congress, a Republican senator from Maryland. I want to say mid-50s through early 60s. I didn't look any of this up. I'm just going on memory. <laughs> just wanted to say a few words about old dad because he, uh, I like to read. I've got, uh, you know, I talk about books a lot and I, and reading and writing is, of course, and speaking is how I make my living and that's how he made his living. And he always had a lot of books around the house and I've got about 25 of them just sitting on my desk and I'm in a room with about a thousand of them here in my office. <laughs> 
and he was an artist too. He's still an artist. I think he's painted some stuff recently, although he's slowed way down. Um, starting around age 50, when I was maybe 14, and I was playing tennis uh, fairly regularly and, and competing a little bit, he picked the game back up, having played um, as a younger man in college. He was a big athlete in college at the University of Maryland, football player. But he also played tennis back in those days, and he uh, picked it up at age 50 and played every day, every single day until about age 91. Uh, I think he played like six days a week, five, six days a week. You know, he'd come home from work, go right up to the high school and pick up a game with his regular group of guys up there. Then my parents moved down to the beach and he did the same thing. And, uh, you know, only recently has he uh, had to slow down a little bit and he never took any medication. He takes, I think he takes one little medication for AFib or something. Um, at the age of almost, at, at the age of 93, and my mother just turned 92. They're still going strong, married 70 years. I mean, he fought in World War II, and they had seven kids, and never complained a whole lot about their their lot in life, but they were never rich, and they still really aren't. Uh, I just I have a lot of admiration, a lot of gratitude for the way I was raised. So with that said, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there and, and to my father. Uh, I want to get on to the real rant, which is really, it's, it's less of a rant. And I realize rant isn't always the best description of what I do because rant, as Gene S., one of our regular listeners, wrote in and said, you know, rant has a negative connotation. Every now and then I will truly rant about something, but mostly I call it a rant because I'm usually imploring you. I'm imploring you and begging you to not do something foolish or to do something which I believe is wise. And today we fall into the latter camp. And very often, since I write this newsletter called Extreme Value, we get this question, how do you value a business? Where? How do I learn to do this? And there's one, there are a couple little things here that are really super important, and they're kind of technical. I'm, I'm taking a big chance here that I'm going to put you to sleep, but just try to hang with me because this is important, and I'm really trying hard to simplify something that's super important that most people don't get. And if you don't get this and you're holding on to stocks for a long period of time, you, this is something you need to understand. So first of all, let's do some negative definitions of what valuing a business is not, Okay. It's not about the P.E. ratio or the dividend yield or the price to book value or EV to EBITDA or any of these metrics. None of those numbers tell you what the – you can't gauge what the business is worth by those numbers. Uh, they're a kind of shorthand attempt at, at gauging the relative maybe attractiveness or unattractiveness of the valuation at any given moment. You know, I'll throw those kind of numbers out myself every now and then. It's just too sloppy and easy and simple to do. Uh, and the thing that, you know, you really have to do to value a business is more complicated. The hardest thing for people to understand about valuing a business, um, there, there's actually two of them, okay, that are intimately related. One is called the time value of money, and the other one is the technique called discounted cash flow. They're actually both fairly simple. I'm not going to get deep in the weeds here. Don't worry. But I do want to talk about the time value of money because it's really important. And I'm going to try to explain this complicated, boring thing. I think I've got it. I think I can do it. It's real simple. If I give you $1 today, well, what's that worth? What's that? It's worth a dollar, right? To receive a dollar today. Um. If you were buying a business that paid you, you know, $1 and that's all it was ever going to pay you for the rest of your life, the most you would pay for that business would be $1. And you're going to receive your dollar today, right now. Okay. What if I said, I'm going to pay you a dollar one year from today, right? Because when you buy a business, you're going to receive all the benefit in the future, and they're going to earn all the money that causes that benefit in the future. So you have to know what you need to pay today for the future earnings of the business. And this is how you figure that out. This is the basic mechanics of it, okay? So what is $1 received one year from now worth today? You think it's worth a dollar, right? But that's not, that's not true because... 
by the time one year passes, I could, let's just say hypothetically, I could have taken that dollar and earned 3% without taking any risk. Let's just use 3%. Okay. Now, what is, so, so, you know, if I invest a dollar today, I'm going to have a dollar three a year from today. No, the dollar is not worth a dollar three. What you really have to ask is, well, how much do I have to invest today earning 3% to receive a dollar one year from now? You see that? You see how that worked? And the answer is slightly more than 97 cents. It's like a huge long decimal place, uh, but just call it 97 cents. So if you multiply 97 cents approximately, okay, by 1.03, which is, you know, adding 3% to it, you're going to get $1. So a dollar received one year from today is worth 97 cents right now using that 3% rate. And you can use any rate you want to figure that out. That's another choice that business valuation people have to make. What is that rate that I'm going to use? It's called the discount rate. Um, and 3% is way too low, okay? Um, most people start at about 6% and go up from there. And we've used 5 and 6% rates. Um, really depends on how much the company pays to borrow money and other things. Um, you know, like I said, it gets complicated quick. This is the simple version. Okay, so what about $1 received? I'm going to pay you a dollar a year from today. You know that's worth $0.97 cents today. And I'm going to pay you another dollar two years from today. What's that? Well, you just have to do the same math on $0.97 cents that you did on a dollar. And that number is approximately 94 cents. So if you add those two things up, you are, what, six and three is nine cents shy of, of $2. So it's like a dollar, it's worth a dollar 91 to receive a dollar one year from today plus a dollar two years from today. And you can see you keep going with this math, right? One year to, from today, two, five, 10, 20, 30 years, whatever, however long you want to go out with it. And there's a number for each of those years based on that 3% rate. And you add all that up, and that is what they call the present value. So 97 cents is the present value of $1 at a 3% discount rate. That's it. That's like the entire enchilada right there. That's the basic idea. When Warren Buffett sits on TV with uh, Becky Quick and says, well, you know, the, the value of a business is the present value of all the cash you're going to get out of it the whole time you own it. That's what he's talking about. That's it. And the process that I described where you do that for one, two, three, four, five, 10, 20, 30 years out, every year that you think you're going to own the business, that process is called discounted cash flow because you're discounting by 3% for all the cash flow that you're going to receive from the business. So how do they do this discounted cash flow? Well, as you probably may have already figured out, you're doing a lot of predicting, aren't you? Because it's all in the future. So you're saying, well, I think the company, you have to estimate, well, I think the company is going to grow revenue at, you know, three or four or five percent or 10 or whatever you think it is. And I think the margins are going to be X, Y, Z, whatever they're going to be, you know, however they're going to behave over time. And I think, uh, you know, you got to make all these assumptions and plug in all these estimates. You're making guesses about the future. That's what it is. I have a problem with that. My problem is, duh, I don't know the future. So all this stuff is based on your ability to guess about the future. So we do something different. And it's outlined in a book by a guy who I'm trying to get on the podcast. Well, it's by Alfred Rappaport. And the guy I'm trying to get on the podcast is Michael Mobison. And Michael Mobison's written a few other good books, and, and he reads a lot of good books, too, and, and recommends them here and there uh, from time to time. You can see him on Twitter and places. So Mobison and, and Rappaport have this book called Expectations Investing. And the idea is, instead of trying to predict the future and plug in what you think the numbers are going to be in the future, you plug in whatever future numbers you have to in order to equal today's share price. Then you look at everything you just plugged in and say, you know, did I have to plug in 30% revenue growth to get today's share price? Oh, maybe I don't, maybe I think that's a little bit too optimistic and I don't want to buy this thing. It's too expensive, in other words. And maybe you look at the revenue growth and you say, like we did this with Starbucks back in August of last year. 
And I forget the exact numbers, but we did something like we looked at it. We said, hmm, Starbucks is priced not to grow at all for the next few years and then to grow very little after that. And we thought, well, that's not going to happen. We think it's going to do a lot better than that. So it was too pessimistic, and we thought the stock was a buy. And we didn't care what the P.E. ratio was. People write in all the time and say, hey, what about the P.E. ratio? Don't care. Doesn't mean anything. Totally meaningless. you got to build some kind of model that accounts for the cash you're going to get out of this business. Somehow, some way, you got to do that. Okay? That's the rant for today. I'm going to keep it real simple and just keep it limited to that much. And I'm sure I'll probably get a million questions that I can't answer. Every time I talk about this stuff, I do. But let's let's find out what's new. And then we're going to, we got a really great guest that we're going to get to in about five or 10 minutes here. First thing I got to talk about is this stock Beyond Meat. It's up like almost 700%. I mean, it had a crazy start to the week, and we recorded the podcast earlier than we put it out, and we got to do some things. So I don't know how it's behaved in the last day or so, but you know, it was way the heck up on Monday, and then it was down at the open on Tuesday. So who knows? But the IPO price was $25, and the last time I looked at it, it was like $170 or $1, I think it was around $169 or 170 Just crazy stuff. And it was trading at like, Somewhere in the ballpark of like 80, I want to say 80, 75 or 80 times revenues. I mean, that's insane. Imagine what that says. You know, you have to, that says if you buy this business at this price and if they have no expenses and no taxes and pay no salaries and have no capital expenditure requirements of any kind for the next you know, just say 70 years and they can pay out 100% of their revenues and dividends, you'll break even. <laughs> it's a little crazy. And of course, we in a previous podcast, we point out Nestle's already coming out with a competing product made of the same stuff. Beyond Meat makes this vegetable based, it's, it's based on pea protein, you know, peas, peas in a pod. And, and Nestle is making the same thing. They're going to come out with a pea protein meat imitation, I don't know what they call it, imitation, fake meat, whatever it is, product that they're going to introduce in the United States. And who do you think is better suited and better financed to distribute absolutely any food product? Beyond Meat, brand new IPO, has two products to their name. Really one. It's all the same thing. It's all imitation meat, imitation chicken, pork, beef, whatever. Or do you think Nestle maybe is a little bit better financed and a little bit more competent? I'm going to go with Nestle. I'm going to say that they'll do better than Beyond Meat. They may, they might, who knows, they might buy Beyond Meat. I don't know. Doesn't sound like they need to, though, does it? Which calls into question, you know, what kind of intellectual property Beyond Meat owns that's worth anything. Um, I want to point out quickly, Apollo, the private equity firm, is buying Shutterfly, the uh, online, you know, photograph uh, management service. And and I have, since I'm pointing out Beyond Meat is egregiously priced somewhere in the neighborhood of like, I don't know, 75 or 80 times revenues, um, I have to point out that Apollo is buying Shutterfly for less than one times sales. So it's not all insane. Um, and I, you know, I don't mean to paint an unbalanced picture. I don't want to be that guy who's always saying, it's all going to fall apart. I just believe that we're late in the cycle and a lot of stuff is overvalued. Now, there was a stupid article in Bloomberg that I have to point out. They were saying that um, the fear gauge is sounding an alarm even as U.S. stocks rise. And they said the, the fear gauge, the VIX, right, the volatility index, was like 16. And it went up a few days in a row when the market was going up. And the VIX usually goes, goes up when the market goes down couple of things here. First of all, at 16, the VIX is not expressing a great deal of alarm or worry. So that's the first stupid thing. The second stupid thing is, as uh, the folks at the Chicago Board Options Exchange told me, and will tell you if you call them up and ask them, the VIX and the S&P 500 are negatively correlated about 80% of the time. So 20% of the time, they go in the same direction. Kind of a dumb article. Just wanted to point that out. 
Okay, rate cuts. Everybody's talking about rate cuts. Will it happen? Will the will the Federal Reserve cut rates? What does it mean? And you see every, you know, regularly in the financial TV news and so forth, you'll see people talking about the market rallying recently, and that means that everybody thinks the Fed's going to cut rates, cut interest rates. And why do it now? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, there is no reason. And it really, th- 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 this is so utterly silly and meaningless for stocks to, re- you know, they fell something like 6%, I think, in, in in May. It was like the worst May in decades and decades. Uh, and now, you know, it's like the market is saying, we think the market's going to go up 20% or something <laughs> in June. I think the best year the market has ever had, best month the market has ever had in history is like, I don't know, 15 or 16 percent. Um, so it's it's just a little bit silly about this gyrations in the market pricing in rate cuts. I, I don't even care if they cut or not. If they cut, the thing I want to own more of than stocks is gold because all this cutting and low interest rates causes equities to become much less attractive. People say they're more attractive because if interest rates stay low, then, you know, equities will be more attractive relative to bonds. Yeah, yeah. If interest rates stay really, really low forever, (laughs) that's true. I'm going to call BS on the forever assumption, okay? All right. Got to point out one little item here. Uh, apparently, like outer space is open for business, NASA announced plans to open the International Space Station to private people, private business, by allowing private astronauts to travel to space. So you can be a private astronaut. Uh, space tourists will have to spend $58 million dollars dollars, $15 million for a ticket to the, to the International Space Station. Boy, they always get you on the airfare, don't they? Yeah. And then another 35000 per night to stay there. Well, that's not bad. Hey, uh, you know, you can, you, some of these, you know, islands that you can rent uh, with a butler and maiden stuff for thirty five grand a night. So, hey, not too shabby, right? On, on, the, on the per night, but uh, boy, they really stick it to you on the airfare. Uh, NASA doesn't only want to, um, you know, it's not, w- what they're doing is they're kind of competing with, uh, you know, let's just say starry-eyed startups and other cosmos-craving companies. Interesting. I, I'm dying to find out the, who, who the first guy or gal is that's going to pay 58 million airfare to go to space. One more thing. Barnes & Noble can't help talking about this. Uh, hedge fund, Elliott Management, run by uh, uh, Paul Singer, pretty smart guy. Um, but they've acquired Barnes & Noble for $476 million, right? So Barnes & Noble started out in Manhattan in one, with one store, and they became this huge bookstore chain that was – and they became known for, you know, cutting prices and, and kind of pushing out the mom and pop bookstores across the country and uh and you know lo and behold of course amazon came along and lowered prices even more and and pushed barnes and noble out and barnes and noble has closed 150 or so more than 150 stores um i don't know what elliott management thinks they're going to do with it like amazon doesn't want to buy it they don't need to they already have every title barnes and noble sells you know, that they can offer uh, for less anyway. So I, I really have no idea what they're thinking. Um, you know, good luck to them. I, I used to love hanging out in Barnes & Noble stores, um, but now I just get it all delivered to the house. All right, it's time for our interview. Really looking forward to this one. Today's interview guest is Frank Bird. Frank is the founder and CEO of Fielder Capital Group, LLC, a New York-based investment advisor that manages money for families and institutions. Frank has 25 years' experience in the investment business, including 15 years in the hedge fund industry working as a research analyst and portfolio manager. Frank is a chartered financial analyst, charter holder, 
and has an MBA from Columbia Business School. Welcome to the program, Frank. Thanks for being here. Great. Thanks, Dan. So, Frank, uh, we did talk a little bit yesterday, but I didn't ask you the one question that I like to start out with, especially for folks in your business who who are in the business of managing uh, other people's money. And that question is simply, you know, there, it seems that there's a whole continuum. Some people started like Warren Buffett buying their first stock when they were 10 years old or whatever it was. And then some people kind of found their way into it gradually over the years. Um, what, what, when did you know that you were going to have a career uh, in, in finance? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. It really goes back to my childhood. Um, I hate that this is a not glamorous story, but uh, I was always enamored with my, the friends of my parents that were in the investment business. And my mother had this mistaken perception that anyone in the investment business was by nature an inveterate gambler. And she absolutely forbid me to go into this business. And so naturally, I made up my mind that I was going to be a stockbroker. So I, I started out of college with Merrill Lynch. I was with Merrill Lynch for seven years, for six of which were as a financial advisor or uh, less glamorously a retail stockbroker. And later, when I went to business school, I worked for a year in their uh, equity research department. But the, really, the seven, uh, the six years as a as an investment broker were deeply formative because I spent those six years calling on rich people. And I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. So, you know, a, a, the, the rich people in Memphis, Tennessee, these were the, the millionaire next door, to, so to speak. And it was a huge education to me because having not grown up with money, I, I had this mistaken notion that people that had a million dollars had Mercedes and huge houses and very quickly learned that Oftentimes, the millionaire next door is someone that drives a very simple car and has everything paid for, uh, often married to the same person their whole life. And as I got to know these people, I would ask the same question over and over again, you know, how did you accumulate such a big portfolio? And very consistently, what I saw was that they had done it buying and holding a collection, a reasonably diversified collection of companies that they believed in, and they held them for decades. And so in my young 20s, I realized, okay, buying and holding companies a very long time accumulates a lot of wealth. And oddly, as I was avidly studying to be a, a good investor and reading everything I could get my hands on in the business press or the, the brokerage research, it seemed contrary to what I was seeing on the front line, so to speak. And then accidentally, truly serendipitously, I stumbled across a, a, an annual report for Berkshire Hathaway. And Actually, it, Frank, Frank, Yes. Uh, so I just want to make clear for the listener, when you say it was contrary to what you were seeing on the front lines, you're basically referring to all the account churning that a lot of brokers do so they can generate commissions, right? Yeah, that's a part of it. You know, the, the, the brokerage business has evolved. And, and t today, the, the great sin, as I see it, is is not the, the blatant buying and selling it at huge commissions. Uh, instead, it is um, uh, hurting people into uh, packaged products that you know, it, it worse have a not clear uh, disclosure as to what the true costs are all in to the investor. Um, and, you know, at best are just very uh, broadly diversified and, and diversified not in a way that we believe accrues to the long-term wealth of the investor. What do I mean by that? Namely, market cap weighted um, index funds even, we, we feel are, are contrary to uh, <clears throat> uh, optimal wealth growth. So in the case of my being on the front line, it was just talking to real people that had done it themselves. And, and, and you know, naturally, they, they had help uh, from advisors, many of them. But it was um, 
it, it was a very long term approach. And, and most importantly, people felt connected to what they owned, right? And, and this sounds a little corny, but they felt like they owned a piece of America. They, they may have owned shares in, in you know, the blue chips of the day, Coca-Cola and, and Procter and & Gamble and IBM and so forth. Uh, and by the way, I, I should emphasize uh, any company that I mention in this podcast, we are not making an investment recommendation. Uh, none of this is investment advice um, because any company or even the strategy I recognize may not be suitable for every listener. Uh, and, and we're going to get into a discussion of founder-led stocks. I just want to emphasize that this group of stocks and certainly any individual stock uh, typically is going to be a lot more volatile than the market. And just because they've outperformed in the past doesn't mean they, they may in the future. But in, in the types of companies I was seeing people buy and hold, there was clearly a connection to what they owned. And they put them in their lockbox and they forgot about it. And as you've probably seen from many of the studies, uh, for example, Dalbar, I believe, uh, publishes an annual study that essentially shows the, the biggest enemy for investors is, is often not the strategy itself was a bad strategy, but the people didn't stick with it. So I, I, at a young age, I became deeply convinced that you know the, the, the buy and hold strategy is important, but equally is you have to be comfortable with what you own because without that, you're not going to stick with it. So look, reading the Warren Buffett annual report convinced me that this was, uh, I had seen it work, what he was talking about doing. And that's why I, I quit a, a very successful practice at Merrill Lynch to go to business school. And he had gone to Columbia and somehow I talked the admissions people at Columbia to letting me in. And I, I went off to, to try to learn how to do what he did. Nice. So you, I assume, have you heard of Robert Kirby, the coffee can portfolio guy? That's what you're describing with this long decades long holdings to me. Have you heard of him? I have not, which of course means nothing. Um, but I, I like the sound of the high level as, as you described it. Yeah. So the coffee can guy has a great story. Um, Kirby was a broker and an advisor, and he would uh, pass along his firm's advice, buy and sell advice to clients. And he had these two clients who were a husband and wife with separate accounts. And the husband died. So the wife called up and said, let me put my account in with my husband's. And Kirby saw that the guy's account, like he had made tons more money than the wife. And the only difference was he ignored the firm's sell advice and just held everything. And the account was like, one of his holdings was worth more than her whole account. And, you know, he had lots of other holdings. So, so this gentleman and I would, would get along um, splendidly. <laughs> Um, absolutely, 100%. In fact, what, what we've tried to craft for our clients is an investment strategy that, that combines two, two powerful forces. One is to, is to invest in a universe that we believe has higher odds of success. And, and that universe, uh, among, not the only universe we invest in, but, but one of our core universes, um, not for every client, but for for clients where this is suitable, uh, is a founder-led portfolio, meaning companies that are being led by one of the founders of the company, and research a growing body of academic literature is showing that founder-led companies have outperformed non-founder-led companies. Uh, over various periods of time. And, and by the way, even if you adjust for uh, company size or industry, uh, the fame and French factors, so to speak, even if you adjust for those uh, that founder-led companies historically have, have outperformed. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, uh, you can go to our website. In fact, I've, I've created um, a list of links to what we have found is the best research in this area. Uh, among founder-led businesses. Uh, our, our website, by the way, uh, if your listeners want to visit, is www.fieldercapital.com. That's fielder like an outfielder, uh, F-I-E-L-D-E-R capital.com. Yeah, and I would encourage people to go there too. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Go ahead, Frank. So number one is to hunt in the right universe, but number two is you need to hold 
your winners. So we have designed a portfolio strategy that allows returns to be amplified by letting winners run and, and thereby exposing yourself to serendipity. And what we have found is that unfortunately, this ability to let your winners ride, this maximizing your exposure to serendipity is curtailed by traditional packaged Wall Street products, right? So if you look at a, at a typical mutual fund, if, if the fund had been smart enough to buy an Apple or, or one of the historically amazing uh, founder-led companies 20 years ago, and, and for the record, Apple is no longer run by a founder, so this is not a recommendation for Apple. But the, uh, the fund would have been selling that winner along the way. And you never would have gotten the impact that you alluded to earlier with the husband who had, who had simply held on and one of his best positions ended up being a very big part of the portfolio. And, and that's what I saw. Um, oftentimes, sometimes up to 50% of the portfolio was in one stock. Now, that's not to say every individual client is going to hold every name to be that big, but we do believe that it's a very individualized decision. You know, you, for example, may be totally comfortable with uh, a big winner at 20% of your portfolio. Maybe your next door neighbor is only comfortable at 10%. Maybe your, your spouse is comfortable with 50%. So it varies by individual. And what we've tried to do is craft a portfolio structure that allows for that individual decision so that the portfolio can be ta tailored to their, to their own risk tolerance, so to speak. So we, we think by combining both the universe of founder-led companies with an investment strategy or structure that allows your winners to run, to run long-term in, in a very tax-efficient way, by the way, because you have deferred uh, – growth, uh, uh, tax deferred growth on, on your capital gains. And if you pass them in your state, at least under present law, it passes tax free to your heirs. So if you combine those two, we believe it substantially improves your odds of long-term success. Um, so when you're looking for founder led companies, like I, I actually went to, there's a fidelity mutual fund, for example, that's a founder led. And I looked at, I downloaded the holdings list and it must've been 200 companies in there. I mean, there was a bunch of them. And then I found another list that was like mid-cap names that were founder-led. And that was like another 300 names. So obviously, you're not, you're, you're not putting 500 companies in these portfolios. Um, you, you're, I assume you're being much more selective than that. So what kind of separates the, the really better founder-led companies from the rest? So it's a delicate balance. Uh, so one approach, of, of course, is, is to literally own all of them. Um, w one of the problems, and, and there are, there, there's a few packaged uh, products out there that, that attempt to employ this strategy. And, and we would love to see more of them because right now we haven't found one that, that kind of fits everything we're looking for. Now, we're, we're an independent fee-only advisor, so I have no ax to grind here. If, if I can find a good manager out there doing this uh, in a really thoughtful way, uh, we're, we're, we're happy to hire that money manager. Um, so far, what we found is that the portfolio structure either you know, retards that long-term growth. Um, so, and, and, and this is not Part of this is is by law, right? A mutual fund has certain diversification requirements, so they they basically have to sell your your big winners as they go up. The um, um, there there are uh, also depending on the product, we we've seen some where the weightings don't make sense to us. For example, uh, if if your market cap weighting and without limit, then you can end up with a with a portfolio that's tech heavy. And one of the things you have to be very careful of is that not all founders are created equally. Uh, for example, there's there's some recent research out uh, from Schroeder's that uh, for the time period that they analyzed found that, believe it or not, internet and software companies, found founder-led internet and software companies actually underperformed the market. 
and it's the more mundane industries that 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 actually had great success. And and this is a good point to emphasize. Mm-hmm. It, typically, when we think of founder led companies, our, our minds immediately jump to the the unicorns and and the and the uh, high profile uh, tech companies. But I want to remind people that there are a lot of great companies that uh, are not technology that are run by founders. Uh, for example, um, Red was one uh, recently acquired. Uh, Apple uh, is, of course, the one we all think of. That's technology. Right. Um, and then uh, DreamWorks is, you know, I guess part tech. But if you um, look at companies like, and, and these are companies that used to have their founders running them until recently. So once again, these are not recommendations for any of these stocks. We don't own these stocks. We don't recommend them necessarily. But the uh, uh, Home Depot uh, had had actually a uh, couple of founders, actually four founders altogether, three in, active in the business until uh, not too long ago. Phil Knight, who wrote probably the best book I've I've read in the last ten years. John and Mackey, Whole Foods, you know, T Boone Pickens and Energy, Howard Schultz, Coffee. I just think about that. Two two of the worst businesses you could probably imagine. If you had come to me and said, hey, I've got this business idea. I'm going to sell $4 coffee, right? I can get a cup of coffee around the cor- any corner for 50 cents, and we're going to put leather seats in, and we're going to let anybody come and sit and just hang out all day. Um, none of us would have funded that business. And of course, Howard Schultz is Howard Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, same thing with John Mackey. The, the food business, the, the grocery business in particular, is a notoriously awful business. And, and he literally... Uh, changed the dynamics of that business model with what he did. So this is not all about just high-tech companies. So I think you want to be very careful with the portfolio structure that you don't end up too tilted in an industry, especially like tech. And and uh, secondly, you know, in, in those roughly 500 companies you alluded to, mm-hmm. you're going to find that a good number of them are – run by very, very old people. Uh, and, and I mean, people in their 70s and 80s. And look, Sumner Redstone, uh, you know, I, I want Sumner Redstone at, at 40 or 50 or 60, right? I, I don't, I don't right. want him in his 90s necessarily. So, um, you know, we, we think age matters. Uh, and, and without kind of revealing the secret sauce, we, we, we do believe there are certain financial metrics that indicate health and vitality and sustainability mm-hmm. that um, that matter and 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 we employ as, as a screening mechanism. Um, so you know, how do we get to our group? We we we, we screen out a, f- a few things. So Frank, I have to ask, how do you feel about Buffett and Munger? They're getting long in the tooth, aren't they? <laughs> well, listen, that's that. Uh, I, I know I'm not alone in saying, um, you know, b- both of them actually have, have been role models uh, for, for me and, and look just about every friend I have um, that, that's a serious investor, both professionally and, and not professionally. I, I think we're all surprised, including Buffett and Munger, that they've had the uh, uh, the energy and longevity uh, to continue doing what they're doing. and. Uh, so I, I don't have anything profound to offer beyond that, unfortunately. Okay. Listen, Frank, I didn't, we, we didn't talk about this yesterday when we spoke, but I, I wonder how much, you know, I actually got to know your, your former partner, uh, Kian Ghazi, through his presentations at the Old Value Investor Congress, and he really blew me away. I thought he was really good. And one of the things that he sort of specialized in was scuttlebutt research, and so I assume you're, you know, as good at that probably as he is. And I wonder how much of that kind of filters into your current process. So that is a, it's, it's a sensitive subject and I'll tell you where I came out on it. So yes, Keon and I um, worked together in the hedge fund that we ran for seven years and a very, very big focus of what we did was primary research, calling customers, calling competitors, calling ex-employees, and, and in an ethical and in an ethical and compliant way, asking for their perspectives on what they saw on the front line. And we were schooled in this from some of the greats in the business, uh, and most of whom kind of came out of the the Tiger management lineage. 
And so we, we didn't invent the strategy and, and, and look, Julian and his team took it from, you know, Phil Fisher and, and Warren Buffett says, I'm, I'm 85%, I'm 85% Ben Graham, 15% Phil Fisher. So, you know, it, it just, it, when you are in the individual stock picking business, and, and I think so many business school students that aspire to be great investors miss this. It is not about your smart investment thesis that you write up front. And I know because I have literally analyzed every trade I've done, or rather I did this uh, analysis back in 2012. I analyzed every single trade that I made over a 10-year period between 2002 and 2012. And what I learned is that that first uh, kind of smart scrub of a business, you know, does does it have, you know, what is the cash flow like? What, how big is the growth opportunity? You know, what are the returns on capital? In, any of the metrics you think matter? Uh, that, that kind of that first, I, I call it the business school scrub. Uh, I literally, when I, when I looked at that first impression, I, I did not create any alpha meaning my hit rate was about 50% and my payoff ratio or slutter ratio was, was about even, meaning I, I was just matching the market. Hmm. And, and that was humbling. And what, what I did find, though, is after I did the deep, deep dive, after I called the customers, called the competitors, you know, spent time going out to see the business, I did learn that um, I had much, much greater conviction because inevitably bad luck happens your favorite idea gets cut in half. And, and go look at the price charts of, of, of any great stock, and there are dramatic declines in the stock price, some of which last for a very long time. And it is so important that you have the conviction to stick with what you own, know what you own, and why you own it. And, and so to me, you know, it was, it was those calls, those, those customer calls that gave me the courage to hold my position because I knew the business. I knew what I own. Now, fast forward to today. Do I still do that? I don't. I made a, I made a philosophical and business model decision that I can get better returns for myself, my own capital, and for my clients by buying and holding a collection of what we think are special businesses run by special people. Namely, this is the uh, you know, founder-led universe. And within this, so the question is, you know, are, am I calling customers and competitors on these founder-led businesses? We're not. And the reason we're not is that, first off, this is not a very big universe of companies. So yes, you mentioned 500, but once you skim off the ones that we believe you don't want to own, but just pure metrics, right? Meaning limiting the sector concentration, you know, cutting out the, the ones that you think are run by people that are not really in their vigor period of life and, and some other um, filters we use, you don't end up with a whole lot of companies. And so we believe that you want to maximize your exposure to serendipity and I believe what I have done is effectively in holding this group of companies outsourced the money management to the CEOs of these companies. Will Thorndike in his book, The Outsiders, uh, it, it really revolutionized the, the way so many of us actually thought of the CEO. Heretofore, we thought of the CEO as, a, as an operator. But the CEO drives capital allocation. And how a CEO allocates capital, meaning do they build a plant or do they buy a competitor or do they just buy back their stock because it's cheap, uh, these decisions have a profound impact on the stock performance over a decade and beyond. And so to me, what's most important is that I have my personal money and my client's money managed by people that, number one, have a documented track record of success. And if you're running a founder, if you're a founder running a business that's publicly traded, to me, that's, that's a track record of success. Number two, I have to trust you. I, I have to believe. And, and how do you do that? How do, how do you get trust? Well, as, as good as you can get it. I have to believe that our financial incentives are aligned. So when we look at founder CEOs, one of the things we also look at is how much stock do they own? Do they own a lot of stock or do they not? Once again, I repeat, not all founders are created equally. 
you and, and I think a very hazardous strategy is to go out and cherry pick founders and, and buy, you know, a dozen of these because it's very hard to identify just a dozen out of what we believe is a larger group where you're going to get the real serendipity. Once again, I never would have imagined that it would have been a coffee company that would have been a great performer, right? So think of of the founder-led businesses. People doubted them up front. Um, by the way, if you want to know why founder CEOs are different than the business school CEOs, and by the way, I, I can pick on business school CEOs because I went to business school, <laughs> um, but it, Read books by people that founded and built great businesses, yeah. and, and many of them are publicly traded, right? So uh, John Mackey, Whole Foods, has written a book. Phil Knight, I mentioned, Nike. Phil has written probably the best book I've read in a decade. Uh, Bernie Marcus and Art Blank, Home Depot, amazing book. Howard Schultz wrote a book, Starbucks. T. Boone Pickens has written a couple of books. Ray Kroc, highly recommend that book. Uh, Founder McDonald's, different story, by the way, than it's nice to hear it from his point of view versus the movie rendition of his story. Um, Peter Thiel wrote Zero to One. I think yeah, if, great if you book. have a kid that's anywhere near 20, 21, 22, should be required reading. Uh, he's PayPal, uh, former CEO. Sam Walton, one of the best books I've ever read, right? So... When you read these books, you realize, man, these people are different. They are different. They come in. They think differently. They're driven by different things. Uh, and, and so, you know, what I want to do is outsource the capital allocation to a group like this. And many are doing things that are counterintuitive to what we think. And I think, you know, this is one of the dangers of, of making, you know, a lot of calls to customers and competitors and you know you make all these calls and then you think that I'm rewarded because of all this work I did and unfortunately in the investment business it's really unfair it's a very unfair business one of my former partners in the hedge fund said to me one day his father was a neurosurgeon he said the thing that's tough about this business is no matter how smart you are no matter how hard you work you're not guaranteed success and everything else, medicine, law, you work really, really hard and you're really, really smart, you're just, you're virtually guaranteed to be successful. So, you know, we on this strategy are trying to design a structure where I can maximize my lifetime exposure to serendipity. So I have outsourced that capital allocation function to a diversified collection of money managers. And these are people that founded the business that have skin in the game and soul in the game. Oh, I like that. Soul in the game. I not, look, I believe people have souls. And if you believe that, then by extension, a company, which is merely a collection of people, companies have souls. And I know this is kind of goofy or, or corny and, and you can't put this in a spreadsheet, but I believe companies have souls. So I want to have my personal money invested in people that have a track record of success and I believe have incentives aligned with me. Uh, they have skin in the game, not just skin in the game, but soul in the game. And by the way, here's the bonus. Let's say this doesn't work. And I, I want to emphasize this disclaimer. Founder-led companies are more volatile as a group. They tend to be growthier. They tend to be smaller. Uh, they will be more volatile. They may not outperform the future. Like the re Again, you can go to our website and, and read the research, and each study is kind of a different period and takes a different angle. But uh, the website's uh, www.fieldercapital.com. And Great if you website. read the research, yeah. you'll be intellectually convinced. I, I believe, I believe. The problem is you've, you've then got to stick with it. And what I know is that even if this strategy, it may beat the market, it may not. If it doesn't, I know that this strategy fits with my values. Intellectually, yes, I buy into it. Philosophically, yes, I buy into it. But most importantly for me, it also fits with my values. I want to be allocating my hard-earned capital to people that are running companies dedicated to innovation. And, and to be clear, innovation isn't just software. It's figuring out how to create a Starbucks-type experience. 
Uh, so I, I want to allocate to people that are helping make just our, our lives more efficient, easier, more pleasurable, safer, just more uh, uh, making the world better. But Frank, Frank, if I could interrupt for one second, it sounds like what you're telling me also is not only are they providing real value and, you know, as you say, making our lives better, but even if they don't, let's say, outperform the S&P 500, it sounds like you trust them to allocate capital. You trust them with your money, basically. So you, you know, you don't expect to blow up. You think that's a very low probability, I'm going to guess. And you'll probably get a decent return if you don't get an absolutely stellar one. And, uh, you know, like you say, serendipity is a great word. I, I call these good surprises, and I love that idea. I've recommended a, a few stocks in my newsletter like that. And the same Taleb in uh, either Black Swan or, or uh, Fooled by Randomness really makes uh, this point. And, and, you know, people perceive him as more of a, you know, the negative side of serendipity, right? The, the, the outlier bad events. Mm -hmm. right. This is just the, the flip of that. This is the outlier good events. And, and I do owe great credit to Nassim for this concept that, you know, I read his books and I'm like, I have not... I have not maximized my personal exposure to serendipity. And so we feel that as long as you own enough of them, and it's not just enough of them to get the diversification, it's enough of them so that you're lucky enough to catch the who'd have thunk kind of company. And, and, and look, you know, I'd rather allocate my money to these quote unquote money managers, meaning the CEO is money manager. Yeah. Because, look, the data by now is clear. You, you know, if, if you look at the performance of active managers, not on a year-to-year -year basis, which is the number of people often quote, it's like two-thirds typically underperform the index. But if you look over a 15-year period and, and account for survivorship bias, over 90% of active managers don't match an unmanaged index. Whoa. And, and, and that's not because these are dumb people. I mean, I, I know these people. They're friends. Trust me, they're, they're, they're brilliant. But this is a really hard business. Um, and I know because I've done it. I mean, I was a professional stock picker for 15 years. And what I, what I realized was, look, if, if I do really, really, really deep work and buy companies that I'm going to turn around and sell in a year or two, which is the, the typical uh, turnover of, of a fund, that's a very, very inefficient way to live your life because the market is so efficient, more than efficient than most of us want to realize, that if you truly track your results and if you're honest with yourself, the market is, is a lot more efficient than most of us believe. So therefore, at the very least, and this is why Buffett recommends index funds, at the very least... <laughs> You know, you buy and hold something that's low fee and you get tax deferred growth on it. He doesn't emphasize the tax aspect, but I, I think he's just trying to keep it simple. The, um, you know, indexing is really good. So passive. So this is why I do passive. There are dumb ways to do passive and there are smart ways to do passive. And according to the academic research that we've reviewed, market cap weighting indexing is not a smart way to do passive. Well, yeah, you wind up pouring money into the biggest company. It's... Totally, 100%. And so what do you, what do you want to do? You want to own a diversified collection of companies. Uh, we, uh, we believe that you know, how you weight them is important. We believe limiting overexposure to certain sectors is important. But then most important is letting, letting your winners ride. Yeah, that's something that we have preached uh, around Stansberry quite a bit. And if I've made, I've made a couple of mistakes in my life, but one of them is not letting the really best winners just ride and ride and ride. 100%. Frank, we're out of time, but I want to see if, if I can ask you to um, kind of leave our listeners with one final thought. If you could just encapsulate for them, it's sort of a game I realize because nobody can encapsulate their whole philosophy. But, but if I, if I told you you weren't going to get to talk to them again and you could just encapsulate your, your wisdom and your philosophy into a single thought, what would it be? Uh, other than hiring me as their investment advisor, <laughs> what would it be? Um, yeah. in all seriousness, uh, literally two words, whatever you do in life, and this goes beyond investing, make sure that incentives are aligned. 
Uh, as best as they can be. It's never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. But number one, I want my incentives aligned with whoever I am trusting to do something important for me, whether it's manage my money, take care of my boy, my kid, right? Secondly, it's got to fit with my values because sometimes life is really hard. And, and, and I promise you any strategy and, and, and any strategy can underperform. And you just want to make sure that that's okay as long as your capital is allocated to something that's consistent with your values. And I, I dare say really clever strategies that are momentum-based or, you know, factor rotation, blah, 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 blah. You know what? That stuff looks great and it backtests great. And you know what people do when the market goes down a lot or it underperforms? They bail. So find something that you think your incentives is aligned and that fits with your values and you think you'll stick with regardless. Oh, that's brilliant. You know, you, you're so much of what you say. I feel like I, I feel like I got, uh, you know, Charlie Munger in the house. <laughs> that is literally the nicest thing anyone said to me in a long time, <laughs> maybe ever. Yeah. All right, Frank, thanks for being here. And I hope that we can, you know, speak with you again sometime and, and catch up in the future. Um, you know, I hope you'll come back and talk to us. Hey, Dan, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Thank you so much. You bet. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. That was really cool. Frank is a very, as you can tell, he's a very thoughtful guy and considers his words carefully. And I think, you know, we benefit from that. And I do recommend going to the website. I spent a little time there. He's got videos and uh, some written pieces and things. And he's got a little podcast that he does. Um, it's really cool. Uh, I really, I enjoyed his videos. They were very educational. And he's even got one that shows a card trick um, that you can, an easy card trick to learn to impress your friends. It's pretty cool. So um, great, great interview. Time for the mailbag. Let's see what we got here. This is, um, this is an important part of the show because look, this is where you and I have a conversation, and that's what I hope the podcast really winds up being is a, an ongoing conversation over a long period of time between you and I about investing and, and investing strategies and companies and people, people like Frank um, and other good money managers with lots of good ideas, whatever's on your mind. So write to us at feedback at investorhour.com with whatever's on your mind. I read every single email. I really do. You know, if we get too big and, you know, there's too many emails, I won't always be able to do that. So it's really cool that I can still do it now. Got a lot of mail. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It was hard to pick. So I actually picked out five of them, but I'm not going to read every word of all of them. All right. So we won't be spending like, you know, a half hour on mail. All right. So the first one of these, I will read the whole thing. Uh, this is Joe L. And Joe L says, hi, Dan. Joe L here. Alliance Plus member invests mostly from extreme value. Joe, you're a smart guy already, I can tell. He continues, podcasts are the best. Thank you, Joe. You encapsulate nicely what I've learned the hard way, which brings me to this point. Clearly, I am not competent in this investing discipline, but getting there, I guessed. What does it mean to be competent? And as it relates to specific companies, how can I ever be a competent investor in a company like Altius? Lots of moving parts, specialized knowledge, etc. Best I can do is co-opt your expertise to find such a company and co-opt Altius management regarding executing their business model. I've owned Altius since 2009. Wow, cool. So my question is, what exactly is my competence regarding Altius? Is being competent following its activities closely, following the markets it's invested in, attending earnings calls, asking questions, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, all that and more. I tried to think of a way to encapsulate this, and it's really hard. It just means knowing the business well. For me, it's come more and more to mean, can I trust these people with my money? Can my readers trust these people with their money? Can, you know, can I really recommend this thing? And is it a good business model? What can I expect from this business model? And one question that I think would go a long way towards getting a company within your circle of competence is thinking about how it can go wrong. How can it go wrong? Well, with Altius, 
They own all these fantastic royalties just pounding out money. They could, you know, for some reason, something could happen where the mines shut down or the production is lower or something. Uh, and that would affect them. Or, you know, just their payments depend on the price of the commodity, right? So copper prices go down, as they have uh, a little bit here. Uh, they make less on their copper royalty. So I would I would say that's one thing that will get you well, that will get a company in inside your circle of competence is thinking about the risks, understanding, recognizing the risk, and uh, and great question. How do you know? And really, the ultimate answer to this, Joe, is not anything that you're going to want to hear because this is a decision only you can make. Ultimately, only you can tell yourself one way or the other. Yes, this is in my circle of competence. You're never omnipotent or omniscient, right? You're never all powerful and all knowing about any business. You can't make things happen. You're not all powerful. You can't make things happen in that business. You can't really make anything happen except buying and selling the stock. And you're not omniscient. You can't know everything that's going to happen. Uh, that's that's my answer. I hope, I hope that does you some good. The next email is from Paul W. And I'm not going to read one word of it because basically what Paul is saying, and other people have said this too, so I just want to get it out of the way. Um, you know, he says, "Hey, uh, you know, I I do short-term trading of stocks and options, and uh, you know, you can you can do this." And he says, "I think you omitted one important advantage to being small, which is precisely the ability to move in and out of markets without causing prices to move." Yes, yes, that and other things too. So, look, I don't mean to say that these things can't be done, and even he also talks about technical analysis in his email. Uh, Paul W does. I don't mean to say that te all technical analysis is stupid. Specifically, what I'm trying to do is, and this is a guess on my part, it's a, I hope it's an educated guess from being in the newsletter business for 21 plus years now. And I've just seen a lot of emails and things from a lot of readers and spoke with them at conferences and things. I'm just a little bit worried that too many people are doing stuff that's riskier than they understand. That's it. That's the whole thing. But I don't, you know, we have people who do options trading and technical analysis and everything. These are, they're real things if you do them right. But good question. Number three, I'm not going to read the whole thing again here. This is by Peter C. And um, he's talking about crowdfunding and he, and he wants me to get a crowdfunding expert on the, on the program. And, but he says, I believe that the top two risks of crowdfunding investing are paying too much upfront for an overvalued company and worse yet, having the company go out of business and seeing the investment go to zero. Well, Peter C., you are, I, I think you're spot on there. Um, and look, my view on this is a little, it may even be worthless, frankly, because I don't really know a whole lot about crowdfunding. But just look at the name of it, will you? crowdfunding. It, I mean, imagine you could stick your head out your window and ask the entire world what they're doing with their money that, you know, in private investments. Would you want to do what they're all doing or would you want to avoid what they're all doing? It's called crowdfunding. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm way off base here. I can be wrong about anything. And this is probably, you know, just like the stupidest oversimplified view of crowdfunding. But be careful. Just be real careful. I'll read another quick paragraph from this email about crowdfunding. Peter C. says, The idea is that you have four to eight losers out of every 10 where you will merely only get your money back or see it go to zero, but that you're one to two winners out of every 10, you should be going to 10x or 1,000% return on your money. That should more than make up for your losers. And if you get a moonshot, that's icing on the cake. Generally speaking, this idea is true, but I think you need to go one more... You need to add, add a zero to all of this, right? So I think, you know, 95 to 99 to uh, 95 to 100 percent of them will be losers. And if you get a winner, maybe you'll get lucky and get a winner sufficient to amortize all your losses and leave you with a profit. I think it's, it, it, it's a super duper long shot type of a thing, but a good question. Okay. Now this next email, I'm going to read every word of it. And, and it's a self, so as you will hear, it's a bit self-serving of me to, uh, to read every word of it because he's very complimentary about a guest we had on the show recently. 
And this is by Steve T. Stevie T. Stevie T writes, Hey, Dan, love the podcast. Been listening for a while now. Thank you for bringing Ken Lewis on your show. I feel an ethical obligation to defend the man. If Atmex sold baby wipes and face wash, I'd never use Amazon again. So he's really into Atmex and he really likes the company. And he continues, I've become accustomed to things from Atmex showing up higher quality than I expected. They always give you the better end of the deal. These are good people, Dan. I have a gold money account for about a year and got on one gold a couple months ago. I've been using them both equally because their vibes are different. Gold money is cool. You can trade platinum and palladium as well as a basket of FX, Bitcoin, and Ether. Especially cool if you're into newsletters about Austrian economics. The account was hard to fund and lots of paperwork. Lots in all caps. One Gold's beauty is in its simplicity. One Gold was super easy and reminds me of Coinbase in its layout. They need to rethink the website design. Even as a Dodger fan, I can't handle that much blue and white. Being able to connect a debit card to an account physically and digitally tied to gold is in fact the holy grail of finance. It's better than Bitcoin because instead of being digital gold in quotes, it is literally digital gold. Thanks, Dan. Stevie T. I'm going to let that one stand all on its own. I haven't signed up on one gold. I plan to do so. I plan to get on there and, and put some money in and do some, you know, just buy a little gold and silver and stuff and see how it is and, and talk about it to you. Uh, last one here, Jean S. And Jean S., um, she's a real good correspondent. She's written in, in a few times. Jean says, hi, Dan. Just got around to listening to this episode. Your guest was excellent. I think she's talking about Mark Yusko because she mentioned him in a minute. Your guest was excellent. She continues, a side note, rant might not be the best word to describe your openings. To me, a rant has a negative connotation, but you're just trying to open our minds and make us think about what's really going on. You're being provocative, which is why we tune in. At least that's why I do. Mark Yusko explained blockchain in a way that made sense. Then he tied in the Bitcoin, which is starting to make sense. I do have a question. When he talked about the safety of blockchain technology... I raised my hand every once in a while. Zero Hedge posts a story about someone having their Bitcoin stolen from their digital wallet. How is this happening? Gene S. Gene S., I don't know specifically about how the, how it happened in either case, but I think when people get it stolen, they have their, they've allowed their, uh, their cryptographic, personal, individual, unique key to be stolen. So maybe they had it on their phone, which... I, I once had a couple of passwords on my phone and I realized that was so stupid just to have them sitting there in a little note on my phone. So I, I deleted them all off because anybody can, you know, it's an easy, easy thing to hack. Um, so I think that's what's going on there. And, and we heard uh, Mark Yusko talk about how Bitcoin gets lost because people lose their key. So they, you know, no key, no Bitcoin, and that's it. But Good question. As far as the rant thing goes, you know, it's funny. I went to back to the home office recently in Baltimore last week and and they said, you know, I wish you would I wish your rants were a little more rantish. And I think a lot of people think of me as like they think of me as a curmudgeon for some reason. And I don't quite get it, but hey, um, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I'm I'm not trying to rant and be like, you know, everything sucks and the world's falling apart and you don't want to do and this is you know, this is bad. That's bad. I don't want to be Mr. Negative, I guess. I don't want to be a, a ranting fool because that doesn't represent reality, right? This thing you have between your ears carries a kind of a, a model of reality, whether you like it or not. And I don't want my model of reality to be a surfeit of pessimism. I think that's a bad idea in life, period. However, what, what I think is good is to share well, today I shared a personal anecdote about my dad because it's Father's Day and to share, um, you know, I, I talked about the time value of money and tried to make that very easy. The rant on that, of course, is you got to know this. That's that's my thing. I feel like people tend to be a little too complacent. You know, they overhear things at a party and or they they think that that trading options or whatever, all these things that I say are, are risky and dangerous. Um they, they think that these things are much more doable because it's so easy to get online and fund an account and do it. 
but that is deceptive. It's really, really, you heard our guest today, Frank Bird, say, it's really hard. This is a really hard thing to do. So that's why I keep calling it a rant, because I'm going to rant and rave until I can't speak anymore, trying to get people to understand the risk they're taking and not be too complacent with the money that they've worked hard for. All right, that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. And I hope you will come back. It's my privilege to talk to you every week. And I look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks a lot. And bye-bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.